This video is a ministry of Chesapeake Church, located in Huntingtown, Maryland. We thank you for watching and hope that this helps you grow into a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. I hear the beautiful sound of babies uh, yelling out. So this is really great to be together this morning. Uh, we're continuing our series, The Way, uh, with a sermon titled, The Increase. And we also get to celebrate covenant baptisms this morning to place a sign of the covenant on our little ones. It's a really exciting morning. So we're going to start by rising. If you could please rise, we're going to sing Fill This Place Together. There is a light that burns in the darkness There is a hope that washes a fear away There is a peace that settles around us It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze Burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes a fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Father, we're on our Every heart beat we bring you this offering Lord come and fill this place Father we're crying out Spirit we need you now Glorious love surrounds us Lord come and fill this place
Let's keep on singing. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe it. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Sing that again. My God will never fail. I'm gonna see you victory. I'm gonna see you victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. 
worshiping together, this song is called Tremble. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, 
Father, we are just so thankful that you are the creator of the universe, and yet you care about every single one of us. We love you, Lord, and we praise you and worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Let there be light. Good morning, everybody. Good to have you here. Uh, you know, we like to say that every Sunday at Chesapeake is special, but some Sundays are special in a special way, and this is one of those Sundays when we uh, watch parents uh, bring their children forward, their infants forward for baptism, and parents can start coming up now. They don't have to wait. So uh, this is just a great moment. It's one of the things probably that I enjoy most is celebrating baptism with our church, and so I'm going to call up uh, Ivy Unger, Addison Crump, Sailor uh, Bogazic, and Shane Bauer, and uh, just to explain a couple of things about when we do infant baptism, what we call covenant baptism, just yeah, stand right along the line here, is uh, baptism is generally considered to be what's known as an outward sign of an inward change, but we are not going to pretend that uh, these infants this morning have uh, made a confession of Christ, that they've experienced that inward change. Instead, what we're seeing are parents who are making a claim of God's faithfulness, looking forward to the day, God's covenant, looking forward to the day when these infants will be uh, making their own profession of faith, and we'll be doing profession of faith baptisms next weekend, by the way. So, uh, you know, we live in a time where parents make a lot of declarations about their children. My kid's going to college. My kid's going to play sports. My child's going to do this. What these parents are saying is, my child is going to grow up in a Christian household. Now, that's a declaration that we don't hear enough these days, but that's what they're declaring. So each, all the parents have met with an elder in an elder interview to make sure that they understand what we're doing here today. And uh, they've come forward, you know, because this is what they want to do, and they're doing it with their biblical community. So I'm going to ask them some questions. The answer to all the questions is yes. That's right. Good. It's an open book test. And then I'm going to ask the congregation a question, because you'll see that we do this together. So this is a very moving time. And if you're a family here, feel free to just come forward and take pictures and do whatever you want. This is a celebration. It's, it's solemn, but it's celebratory at the same time. So feel free to come forward. And uh, I'm going to ask some questions. We have some water here that we're going to uh, sprinkle on their foreheads. Nothing special about the water. It's just water, but it is a symbol of the cleansing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're, we're ready? Okay, I'm going to start over here and ask the questions. Parents, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on your child's behalf and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as you do for your own? Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon his divine grace that you will endeavor to set before your child a godly example, that you will pray with and for your child, that you will teach your child about Jesus Christ, and that you will strive through all the means of God's goodness to raise your child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Yes. And to, yes. Okay, all right. He's on board with us. He's the one who was telling me no when I baptized him. <laughs> Two years ago, I baptized this little guy. He going, no, no. <laughs> Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting these parents in the Christian nurture of their children? Yes. Okay, you see, you're not in it alone. We're in this together. Okay. Where's Marlon? Who's, who's got the water? Okay, there you are. He's a tricky one, Marlon is. By the way, Marlon is one of our elders. Nate Fair is over there. He's another one of our awesome elders that we have here. Okay, this is Shane Bauer. Shane Bauer, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And how beautiful to have the whole family up here doing this together, isn't it? It's just great. Okay, we've got Sailor Bogazic. Now, I baptized all of these kids, right? And 
Yeah, so I, I bet, yep. and your husband, so I baptized all your and children. You. <laughs> <laughs> and you. So that, this whole family here has been baptized at Chesapeake. <laughs> Sailor Bogazic, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. And she fell asleep with my words. <laughs> Not the first one in this church to fall asleep. This is uh, Addison. Hey. Addison Crump, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Hey, Ivy. Ivy's got sparkling boots on. Ivy Unger, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Huh? Yeah. Let's take a moment and pray for these parents. Father God, we, uh, we first, we just thank you for your goodness, your grace, your love, your faithfulness. Lord, we look to you to keep the promise that has been made here today. Father, we ask now as extra measure of grace on these parents as they raise their children in what are, can only be called turbulent times, that they will need their church community, their family, their friends around them. They will need the blood of Jesus Christ to be poured out onto their family, the grace of the Holy Spirit to empower them, to be bold and fruitful in the name of Christ. We thank you for their open declaration of their children and their commitment to raise their children in a Christian household. Lord, bless us as a community to stand by these parents and to be with them. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the victory of the empty tomb. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, well, I didn't know I was going to have to follow that up this morning, so just give me a minute while I finish crying. <laughs> well, good morning, church. My name is Megan. Welcome to Chesapeake. It's such a special Sunday to just be together. If you are new and looking to get connected, then here is your next step. Visit the link. The link is where you'll find your Let Us Know card, and you can learn about our starting point group coming up on November 2nd. And if you're looking to go all in here at Chesapeake, then the link is your place to join a serving team, learn about upcoming events, and sign up for groups. You can visit the link in person after service. It's right outside those back auditorium doors, and the people there would love to meet you. You can also visit the link online in two places, at chesapeakechurch.org slash link, and right on our Chesapeake Church app. And if you don't have our Chesapeake Church app yet, now's a great time to go ahead and download it. On there's a Bible that we would love for you to use. In fact, this morning's message is going to be focused in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, so we can all mark this and be ready to follow along. And while you have those phones out, if everyone can just double check and make sure that they're silent, this is just a great way we can serve each other and help to keep our service distraction free. Well, in a moment, we'll be making an offering, but first, we have a great opportunity for you. There are families right here in our community that are making the difficult choices of paying rent, buying groceries, or filling their car with gas. They are not even thinking about changing the oil in their cars. Now, we have the opportunity to alleviate that financial burden by providing a free oil change to keep their car running safely. Oil Change Day is coming up on Saturday, November 5th, and you and your family have the opportunity to be a part of this event and serve these families right here in our community. And don't worry, you do not have to be a mechanic to join a serving team. You can do anything from changing oil to driving to greeting and hospitality. So you can register you and your family to serve right now through the link, either online or through our Chesapeake Church app. And you can also stop by the link in person. Jeremy will be there, and he would love to help get you and your family signed up. Now, as always, breakfast and lunch is provided for our volunteers, and this year we are excited to say that our volunteers are doing a chili cook-off. So if your family thinks that you make the best chili, then that is the team you will want to sign up for and join the competition. And remember, if you know someone who could use a free oil change, please invite them to register their cars at chesapeakechurch.org slash the link. And this is your final reminder that our congregational meeting is coming up tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here in the auditorium. We will be voting on the Office of Elder, so if you are a formal participating member, please make it a priority to be there. 
Free childcare is available for those with young kids, so if you haven't done it yet, now is your time to RSVP for childcare. And again, you can do it right through the link, both online or through the app. Now remember to visit the link and get yourself connected. There are so many things going on around here, and we would love nothing more than for you and your family to be part of that. And now it's that time in our service where we make an offering. And we emphasize each and every week at Chesapeake that the church doesn't take an offering. The people make an offering. So if you're new, please don't feel any pressure to give. You're our guests, and we're so glad that you're here. If you feel moved to give, we thank you, and we believe God will bless your generous spirit. And for those of us who consider Chesapeake our church, we know that this is our time to return that portion of God's blessings. So you can drop your offering in the bags as they come by, or you can give right on our Chesapeake Church app. You'll just hit that Give button in the bottom right of the home screen and choose the way you'd like to give. So we hope that's one more way that we can serve you better. Now, as we prepare our hearts for the message this morning and just continue to be in worship together, this verse in Deuteronomy reminds us to be strong and courageous because our God gives us nothing to fear. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for making us strong to do what you need us to do without fear. We commit this offering to further your will and build your kingdom. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. sing no longer slaves so please rise and sing this together you won't rival me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God
Yes, I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. We sing, No Longer Slaves. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Let's hear those voices. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I child of God I am a child of God Father thank you so much that you are the king who adopts us Lord into his family Father we are so grateful we love you pray that we can return even a fraction of the praise Lord praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. I just want to get something out of the way this morning. I've heard um, rumors and I've heard gossip, and we all know that the world we live in today with social media and, and all things that we can do on the internet, just all sorts of stories fly out there, and who knows what to believe and what's true. And so I just I felt burdened uh, by the Spirit as I was sitting there just to go ahead and address it. And that is that, yes, my family put up our Christmas tree this weekend. Um, <laughs> Don't care that it's October, uh, you know, I, I, it's controversial, I know, but whatever, you know, I'm a, I'm a man of courage, the Spirit has given me boldness to, to put up my Christmas tree. Um, I feel like in this series, The Way, which we're wrapping up this morning, we, we've, we've covered a, a number of topics that uh, maybe aren't our favorite to address, um, sermons about, you know, money or serving, being a better Bible reader, uh, being a more consistent person of prayer. It's not that I think we hate these topics, but we talk about them and, and we feel guilty sometimes. Like, I know that I should give, or I know I should serve more, or uh, I, I don't read my Bible enough. I wish I were more of a person of prayer. And, and, I, and I get that feeling because for me, the topic I've always really dreaded hearing about was evangelism. Uh, whether it was a sermon or evangelism training, or I had to take an entire class on it in seminary, the topic of evangelism has always made me feel guilty. I mean, for one, just as an introvert, the idea of just knocking on like my neighbor's door, it, it's just, it just terrifies me. Uh, I, I'm a very non-confrontational person, and so the idea of potentially upsetting somebody gives me anxiety. And on top of that, I've just never have felt about evangelism, the way that I've seen others around me feel. I would grow up, you know, my pastor would say, uh, you know, it should break your heart uh, that there are people who don't know Jesus. It should make you want to cry, the idea of people spending eternity in hell. And frankly, I'm just not that kind of emotional person. Uh, I mean, as I've gotten older, maybe a little bit more so, or, you know, if you put on the movie Rudy or anything about dogs, I'm a blubbering mess. But the topic of evangelism has just never moved me the way I would see others around me be moved. And it made me feel like that there was probably something wrong with me as a Christian that I didn't feel these ways. But the more that I've studied scripture, the more I'm convinced that we really have gone about talking about evangelism and missions in the wrong way. I don't think a guilt-based approach will, will motivate any of us to, to share our faith more, just like I don't think a guilt-based approach will lead us to give more or serve more or pray more. I think the answer is educating ourselves with what God's Word says and then asking the Spirit to move within us, to move through us. Take, for example, this morning's key verse, every day the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. This verse is of tremendous relief and joy to me. 
The disciples did not add to their number. The church did not increase its own membership. The apostles did not save people. The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is God's work, not ours. Essentially what verse 47 tells us is that what happened and what still happens today when the church devotes herself to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, to holding all things in common, to gathering together. When the local church devotes herself to what God says to devote herself to, then the Lord himself will bring people to a saving knowledge of his son through the church. I mean, that's, that's it, friends. I mean, that's, that's the sermon. Devote yourself to these things and leave the rest to God. We could just end right there. You could get a head start on the lunch rush. Should we be done? But what I want to do this morning is as we look at the testimony of Scripture, of what God was doing through this first church, I want us to see how the story of Scripture itself is a big, giant story of how God is redeeming the world to himself. We're going to go from the very first chapters of the Bible all the way to almost the last one. And so I encourage you, if you brought your Bibles with you this morning, to open them up to Genesis 1 and 2 or to pull it up on your app. Or we've got free Bibles at the back of the auditorium. If you don't own one, please take them. There's nothing we love more than restocking those shelves with Bibles. And so please take one. There are no strings attached. There is a tracking device in there so we know where you live. But, you know, I'm... You can find on which page that is. We're looking at really the whole big picture to see that Acts 2, 42 through 47, was not just some one-off thing that happened 2,000 years ago, never to occur again. Now, what God has been doing in his world since the beginning and to its completion is rescuing this creation We see this morning that since the beginning of the world, God has been drawing humanity to himself incorporating them in his mission of building his kingdom. Our calling as the church, therefore, is to simply follow him humbly and obediently in that mission. And so as we go to Genesis 1 and 2, we have the foundation of the mission of God. Genesis 1 tells of God's creation of the world, how in the first three days of creation, he he, he makes these domains or these kingdoms, these places, And then the second day of creation, he he creates those to rule over the domains, right? Look at this. The the luminaries of day four, the star, the sun, the moon, they rule over the day and night that was created in day one. The fish and the birds of day five are given dominion over the waters and the sky of day two. And then the animals of day six are given dominion over the land created on day three, with humanity being given dominion over all. The whole world is God's kingdom, and yet God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God creates humanity with a purpose, with a mission, his mission. And what is that mission? Well, we see in chapter 2 that God creates this beautiful region on the earth called Eden. And then specifically within that region, he plants a garden. And the garden is described as this lush and, and fertile place, almost the cradle of life itself. But what makes this garden so special is not the flora, it's not the fauna, it's the unique presence of God there. This garden is the place where almighty God comes to meet with his people, to dwell with his creation. And so there are Adam and Eve in the garden. They're enjoying God's presence, but God says, don't stay here in the garden, but carry my presence out with you. In verse 10, we have this picture of one river that flows to the garden. But then when it gets to the garden, it becomes four rivers and flows out to the rest of the earth. It's a picture of how God's rich presence comes into the garden, gives it its life, but it's not supposed to stay there. It's supposed to flow out to the rest of the world. 
In other words, humanity is to take this special place called Eden and expand it to the ends of the earth. Just like they're called in chapter 1 to fill the earth, we see in chapter 2 they're to fill the earth with the worship of God. That's God's mission. Written into the story at the very beginning, Eden is this garden temple city, and the boundaries of that city will expand as the human population increases. I mean, just think about logically, if Adam and Eve had never sinned, they would have just had babies without sin, who would have grown up and had babies who, who didn't have sin, and the human population would have increased of sinless, worshiping creatures. As Eden would grow, so would the worship of God all over the earth. I just point this out, friends, so that we would see that mission didn't begin with Matthew 28. It is found even before sin entered the earth. Mission is the activity of filling the earth with the worship of God, which means that that's your identity. That's what you were made for, that God has woven his mission into the very fabric of our being. And so we have to understand, friends, that our joy in life, our satisfaction in life will always be tied to the purpose with which God made us. Meaning conversely then, whenever we have times of, of frustration or pain or vanity in our lives, it's a sign that we become estranged from God and his purposes. For our greatest hope in life and death is that we are not our own, but belong to God. And, and note the we there. This is a mission that God invites us into. Since Eden, it has been a mission for a people. In other words, God has always intended to accomplish his purposes through a community, through a family of faith. Flip forward to Genesis 12, and, and you'll see what we mean here, because seemingly out of nowhere, God calls this man named Abram, to whom he says, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Broadly speaking, these verses, they, they set the trajectory for the rest of the entire Bible. That God is going to build his kingdom, going to build his city, that which Eden was supposed to be. And God will do it through Abram. He will invite Abram to share in his glory. And he himself will make Abram's name great. God then further expresses this mission when he makes a covenant with Abram a few chapters later in Genesis 15. Having given Abram the marching orders, God appears again to now seal this promise of what he will do through Abram. It's a really strange two-day ordeal that we read of in Genesis 15. God uh, literally says, cuts a covenant. And this would have been a very common ancient ceremony in the Near East. This was a ceremony in which two parties would, would enter into almost a contract, a relationship together. And what it would have looked like is you would have taken a number of animals and sacrificed them and then cut their bodies in half and laid out the dividing pieces in a long procession, almost creating an aisle. I mean, incredibly bloody, gruesome scene, no doubt. We had thought about illustrating it up here, but worried that we couldn't get the blood out of the carpet. Um, but think about that scene. It was intended to illustrate just how serious the covenant being made really was. And what would happen next is once those pieces were lined up in the procession, the two parties would get on either side, and they would walk in between through the blood and meet in the middle. It was a way of saying, may I become like these animals if I break the covenant? May I be torn in two? May I bear the curse of death? And yet, in Genesis 15, God and Abram standing on either side of the procession, they don't meet in the middle. Instead, God manifests his presence to Abraham in the form of a smoking fire pot and flaming torch, and he himself crosses all the way through to meet Abram on the other side. 
You see, in this ceremony, God was revealing how he would accomplish the mission entirely himself. And he would do so through Jesus Christ. I mean, what a picture of sin we have in this chapter. Everything's completely dark. The darkness representing not just the spiritual condition of of Abram, but really of, of all humanity. How we are all dead in our sins. That here's the core of the problem. It's not just that the world is estranged from God, but that each and every one of us are as well. And so you have to wonder, how can God then fill the earth with his glory, with his worship? How can his presence dwell among us when we and our very souls are alienated from him? And it's not just the darkness of Genesis 15 that illustrates our sin, just the death of these animals. All of these animals sacrificed, cut in two, the ground utterly saturated with blood. And in the midst of the scene of darkness and blood, the light of God shines through, walking through this path to confirm and seal the covenant. I mean, just think about it. Almighty God. God most high walking through a pool of blood. The thought of you or me doing it is unpleasant to think of, let alone the holy majesty of God. And yet in all his glory, in all his power, in all his regal majesty, God expresses his love in such a personal way. As I already said, in a usual blood covenant, each party would meet in the middle, showing that they were responsible for keeping their side of the agreement. But when God makes this promise... He promises to keep both sides of the agreement. He says, if this covenant is broken for whatever reason, for my unfaithfulness or for your unfaithfulness, I will pay the price. If you, Abram, or if your descendants ever fail to keep it, I will pay in blood. He knows that that moment when Almighty God crossed the path of bloody carcasses, He was pronouncing a death sentence on his son, Jesus. The cross is what makes the accomplishment of the mission of God possible. In the death of Christ, sin is defeated. In the death of Christ, death is defeated. When Jesus emerged from the grave on Easter morning, he was ushering in the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth. It's in Jesus that the consummation of Eden began. And it's at that point, as he rises from the dead, before he ascends into heaven, that he brings his people back into the mission. He says to his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. As you go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And note that small uh, translation change that we made there in verse 19. You know, often when we talk about the Great Commission, we we say, oh, go therefore and make disciples. But in, in Greek, that word go, it's not the command. It's a participle. The verb in this passage, the command, is the make disciples part. In other words, Jesus assumes that his disciples will already be going as you go about having been about. What is he telling them to do then? He's telling them what to do as they go. You see, often I feel like when we think about mission, when we think about evangelism, we often reduce it to just the the going part, as if that's what God commands us to do. And so because mission is about going, we see mission as something that happens somewhere over there. But what we see is that in Jesus' eyes, friends, we are already going about every day of our lives, right? We go to the store. We go to our workplaces. We drop our kids off at school. We we go to the pub. We go to the park. We are going all the time. And most everywhere we go are people. And so our part in the mission, therefore, is to simply introduce those people where we go to Jesus, 
to walk alongside them, to teach them how to follow him as well. Again, it's in his power. It's his mission. We're just telling a lost and dying world that there is now free reconciliation with your creator. You don't have to be seminary trained. You don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have to be charming or an eloquent speaker. It's like we talked about a month ago when we were discussing the breaking of bread in the early church. It's about forming relationships, intentionally living out our faith walk with Jesus, and creating opportunities to share the gospel. Which means, friends, that this is going to often be a, a lengthy process. Yes, God still works in miraculous ways, and he brings us into chance meetings and, and, and we are able to share the gospel, and that person comes to faith right then and there. But more often than not, that process of introducing somebody to Jesus, to seeing them make a profession of faith and walk, it's not something that just happens overnight. You know, as I've talked about this before. As, as our family just moved here, we're, we're thinking about, okay, how do we get to know our neighbors? You know, and right when we finished unpacking boxes, I didn't say, okay, let me go door to door and just say, hey, I'm Patrick. We just moved in. By the way, you're going to hell. Um, sorry about that. Um, no, we, we make small talk. We introduce ourselves to others. We, we get to know about people's families. And it's not about just being a, a car salesman and trying to manipulate those relationships to a point where we can ask for the sale. We, we genuinely want to know these people, want to care about them. We want them to know that we care about them. And we want them to get involved in our lives as well, to, to see in action how our faith in Jesus shapes our parenting, how our faith in Jesus shapes our marriage, how our faith in Jesus helps us navigate through the crises of life, the hard times. As the Apostle Peter would write, we want to show the hope that we have in Jesus so that they're curious and they ask, why are you so hopeful? Why do you do things like this? Why do you do things like that? And then we can give a defense for the hope that we have in Christ. And the best part about it is we do this in confidence. We do this with a certainty that God will succeed because, again, it's his mission. He's the one who adds the increase it is the Holy Spirit that gives faith. It is the Holy Spirit that regenerates the human soul. I don't sweat whether or not I'm able to persuade somebody to pray a prayer. You know, it, I don't count numbers. We don't chart successes because it's God's mission. It's been his since the beginning, and he will finish it. Because just as the story of the Bible begins in a temple garden, it ends in much the same way. God's intentions to see that temple garden city fill the whole earth comes to its culmination in Revelation 21. We read there that when Jesus returns, he will set this world to rights. He will make all things new. He will establish his new Jerusalem, a temple garden city that fills the entire earth. This new Jerusalem will not just be a restoration of Eden or a replica of Eden. It will be what Eden was supposed to grow into all along. It'll be a place where all is made right. How all those glimpses that we get sometimes of what God is doing around us, the hints that we get along the way, they will come in full. And we will see them come in full in a way that far exceeds whatever we could imagine. Think about that last picture of Adam and Eve with God back in Genesis 3 after they sinned. They, they hid from God in shame and guilt. Well, there will be no more hiding on that day. Now there will be the privilege and the ability for you and me to look our God full in the face. How often the Bible talks about how none can see God and live. How Moses just saw a shadow of him, saw his back but on the day when Jesus returns, when he finishes this mission, we will come to God, yes, in humility, in awe of who he is. But we will not come in a sense of unworthiness at all. Because our worthiness on that day to look God in the face was accomplished for us by Jesus Christ. The church of Acts 2 was, was living in an already but not yet reality of the kingdom come. 
The work of Christ had been finished. It was done. The gift of the Holy Spirit had come now to indwell the church. The church was living in this new reality, but it was not a finished reality yet. The world had not yet been fully set to rights, which is why the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. And friend, the church is still living in that season. We are right there with them in Acts 2. I think when we have a better understanding of just the big story of God and what he is doing in this world, then we can understand our part, our place in the story. So often, I think our, our daily routines, our, our work can just feel vain or, or pointless or, or mundane. But here we see how God has restored the purpose of our every day, that today we can start to enjoy the foretaste of the kingdom consummated. How, Christian, we are already citizens of the city of God right now. We are just joyfully waiting for the day when it will come in full. And so don't check out of your daily task. Don't see them as just routine and mundane, but let's be faithful to the calling God has given us. Let us be confident that he will give the increase. What are we to do while we wait? We're to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to any as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people every day. The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I pray that this series through Acts 2, the way that it has been a blessing to you, that it has opened our eyes to what God wants to do in and through us, the great promises that he has for us, his faithfulness to keep his promises to us. Next week, we're going to celebrate a visual representation of that new life as we celebrate profession of faith baptisms. Pastor Robert's going to talk about baptism, talk about how we're worshiping God through this new life. We'll get to celebrate Robert in his last official Sunday as our senior pastor. Meanwhile, here, and in just a second after we finish closing, we're going to have the opportunity as a congregation to also celebrate the ordination of two new pastors here at Chesapeake. And so they, they told me in the park very specifically that they want you to go get your kids first and then come bring them back. Uh, and so after I close this in prayer, please go get your kiddos, come back, and let's just have a time of celebrating still what God is doing uh, among our, our community. Would you stand as I close this in prayer? Father, you are great. You are worthy and awesome to be praised. There is none like you. None equal in power. None equal in goodness. And so we praise you. We celebrate you. That is a strong and mighty God. You can surely bring things about according to your perfect wisdom. But as a good God, we know that your plans for us and for this world are good and perfect. And so, Father, we ask you simply by your Holy Spirit to increase our faith, to, to mold us, to grow us, to use us in whatever way would delight you. We thank you that we can have confidence, that we can have hope this morning of the new life that we have in your son, Jesus, that we can have confidence that he will most surely return and set this world to rights. We can know that for certain because the grave was empty on that Easter Sunday morning. And so, Father, our only prayer is that you would simply magnify yourself, that the fame of Jesus will grow mightily in this community and to the very ends of the world. We love you. We praise you. In your son Jesus' name, amen. You've been hurt in the battle.
pattern You're evolved with the truth Searching so hard for something You stumbled back into you You said this time would be different You never do that again But your promises vanish Like words in the sand Look up Your help comes from heaven Look up For more information about Chesapeake Church, visit us at chesapeakechurch.org or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook.